Amen. Christ is risen, my friends. It's not a one day a year thing. It's kind of an everyday thing to know that Christ is risen. And we say, glory be to God. For we come here and worship with our hope in the chief cornerstone, the foundation of our lives. So welcome to worship. Now is the time to sing praises to God. Now is the time to rejoice and to be glad. Now is the time to stand on the name that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Welcome to worship. Welcome to God's house today. We're so glad you're here and we're so glad that you're watching and with us on um, online right now. And friends, I, I need you to do something uh, special. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk over here, not for my close-up. Uh, I'm going to turn this, okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to wave to Ruby because Ruby is watching us today. Ruby is home. Ruby, we miss you. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, continue to miss you until you're able to to come back. And uh, we're so glad that you are home, that you're feeling better, and and just pray for God's grace and mercy to continue to bless you. We also want to uh, pray for and just lift up Dick Ingles. Dick is wants to be here, but he can't be here, and he's watching as well. Wave to Dick. Wave. Hello, and to all, all of our church family, we're, we, we wish you could be here, and if you're not, we just, we want you, if you're watching, to know that, uh, that you're really in the presence of God as well. Uh, you are with God, and God is with you, and now is the time to worship. And so, my friends, let's rejoice and be glad. Let us come to the Lord with a grateful heart. Would you bow your heads, and let's talk to God in prayer. Lord Almighty, Greet us with your Holy Spirit this morning and awaken our hearts so that we might hear your greeting to us. Just as you greeted the disciples at the empty tomb, let us, Lord, hear your greeting. Let us hear and receive and feel the touch of your grace this morning. And we pray that you bless this gathering and that you fill it with the possibilities of your grace. Because your love is victorious. Your love conquers the grave. Your love blesses us with new life, resurrected life, redeemed life, whole life, renewed life. And so God, bless our singing, our praying. Bless our listening and our proclaiming. Bless this time as you work your grace in our lives. For we love you and we give you our love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, now is the time for faith. Now is the time to stand and sing, trust and obey. Would you stand and let's sing our faith in Christ our Lord. But 
to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet, or will walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he says we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and Join me in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to the Father. you may be seated and we want to take a moment to bless these gifts that have been just made out of of love we have prayer shawls that uh, are throughout the congregation throughout the pews here and they're not everywhere but we wanted you to see how these are made by a faithful group of disciples uh, and and we give them away we give them to people going through difficult times or people who might feel lonely or people who just need a little bit of reassurance in life. And so these prayer shawls are a ministry very dear to this church. And we want to uh, just recognize this ministry and, of course, take time to to bless the work of these prayer shawls because these, these are, are instruments of God's grace. And they give to someone in need that powerful reminder that with God all things are possible. And so uh, I would just ask that uh, if you're near one, you can lay hands on it. If not, you can just maybe hold your palms up as we, as we turn to God in prayer. And let's, let's bless these. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for just wrapping our lives in the warmth of your love. We praise you for the strength of your caring hands and for the ways that you guide our steps. And we ask for those same blessings to be upon these prayer shawls, because these are going to be given away. And we don't always know who receives them, but we ask that the recipients of these prayer shawls feel the warmth, feel the breath of your Holy Spirit as they wrap themselves in it. We pray that they also find comfort in knowing that they are not alone in this world. So bless and use these shawls to remind its recipients about the possibilities of your grace and the assurance that your Easter is for them as well. Father, we thank you for the hands, the many hands who have prepared these shawls. We're grateful for their work and simply ask that you use this ministry, use these shawls for the work of your kingdom and the blessing of your children. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. Aren't they beautiful? Um, if, you, if you're near one, 
Just, just pick it up for me. If you pick it up and maybe stand so the rest of the congregation can see one. If you've got one, just pick one up and, and stand because it's not, you can't see them all. Just turn around and, and maybe let, let the church see the different sizes, the different colors. Aren't they beautiful? They're beautiful. Would you give a word of thanks for that ministry? Amen. Amen. That's important. And you know, I, even as a pastor, I've received prayer shawls over the years, and I still have them. They're still in my office. If you want to come, I'll share them with you. <laughs> but they are beautiful. And, and when you get one, it's a powerful, powerful ministry. It's a wonderful gift. And now we're going to listen to God's Word. We're going to receive God's Word today as we read from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Listen for a message from God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. For if you, for you, for if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in, in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord, and we can trust it. Thanks be to God. Amen. My friends, we're going to sing our next hymn, We Walk by Faith. Let's sing together.
would you pray with me? Gracious God, we do believe. Sometimes it's difficult to believe. Sometimes just the stresses of this life and this world just squeezes a little too tight and it makes our hearts weary. And that's why we ask God for a strengthening of our faith today because you are our life. You are the nourishment that we need because God, we want to be alive. We want to live, and we want to live the life that you provide. And you tell us, you teach us that we are to abide in you as you promise to abide in us. And in that relationship, there comes life. So help us to be grounded in you. Use this time, use the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on our hearts to nourish and to feed and to encourage us this day. For you are our Lord and you are risen. Christ, you are risen indeed. Amen. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but you can go and tell someone in the night sky that there are 300 billion stars out there and they'll probably believe you. But if you tell that same person that this door or this chair or this bench or whatever is is freshly painted, what do they do? They got to go touch it. Now, you've done that before, something similar. I've done that before because that's the Thomas that is within us. And I'm not just talking about the doubt. I'm talking about that need just to make sure, just to touch it, just to make sure. Because Thomas was a realist, right? And touch was important to Thomas. He he needed that tangible reassurance. And there are times in our lives when we need that tangible reassurance. And it obviously helped him, right? Touch helped him. It helped him in many ways, but in one way in particular, it helped him to remember. Touch helped him to remember. And, and, you know, touch is one of our bodily senses, and I think touch is important to us as well. It's important to us for the same reason that it was important to Thomas. In one way, touch can help us remember. So I want you to do a little exercise with me. I want you to trust me. I'm not going to throw anything at you or make faces at you, but I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. And what I want you to do is I want you to touch your sleeve. I want you to feel how smooth and soft your clothing is. And now compare that with the rougher feel of the pew cushion. Feel that pew cushion. Now that's a little bit rougher. Now I want you to just stick out your hand and feel the smoothness on a project and they're just about to finish. What do they what do they say? Well, I'm putting the finishing touches on it. We talk about how emotions can be like touchy-feely events. But we can also use touch in a negative way. We could say that person is out of touch with reality. Or if there's a situation or a topic we don't want to be a part of, what do we say? I wouldn't touch that with a what? I don't want to be a part of it. I'm not going to touch it. It it scares us if we ever hear a doctor say, it's touch and go right now. 
right? And we know that there can be a single look, a single gesture, a, a single act that can set off a series of, of events, touch off certain uh, emotions and so forth. And then if you're a parent, probably the, probably the most hated phrase in all of parenthood occurs on those family vacations when the kids are crammed in the back seat of the car. And I remember those trips having to go with my older brothers who were mean. I'll say that to them. I don't care if you're watching or not. Yeah, they were mean. But I remember us in the back seat of that car, and it's that one phrase that parents don't want to hear. He's touching me! But it was dad who always had the right touch when he would say, don't make me pull this car off the side of the road. You know, that would cure a lot of things amongst brothers. Yeah. So touch, touch can evoke all kinds of memories. And, you know, we even establish places where you can go and touch and remember. I mean, I've never been, but there's the Vietnam War Memorial. And have you ever seen people just go up and touch the names of those fallen soldiers? How about the, the Wailing Wall? In Jerusalem, you see people putting prayers and just and touching that wall because that's as close as they could get to the Temple Mount for the Jews. They go and touch that. I, I've seen people visit loved ones, deceased loved ones, in, in a cemetery. And, and what do they do? They go up to the headstone and they touch the, the engraving of the name or the date of their lives. They touch that so that they can remember. Touch is very important to our lives, and it even helps us remember. Touch was important even to Thomas. It was very important to Thomas. And we don't know where he was when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. They were all locked in a room. They were locked behind closed doors for fear that they would receive the same fate, the same treatment of Jesus. So they were hiding. They wanted to be out of touch from the rest of the world. They wanted to be isolated for fear of what might happen. And you know, they were still confused and they were still overwhelmed by the crucifixion and the resurrection and they wanted to believe, but it was just hard and they weren't willing to make that leap of faith yet. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there was Jesus standing among them in that room. How did he get there? It wasn't a trap door, I can tell you that. That was just Jesus being Jesus. And he comes and stands among them, and it's amazing. He's suddenly there. And you know the disciples were shocked. You know they were overwhelmed. And they looked, and they watched, and they were excited. They were enthralled, and they wanted to soak up every moment that they had with Jesus. And when Jesus breathed upon them, you remember that in the story? Jesus breathed upon them. Don't you know that they breathed in deep? I mean, we dare not do that today in COVID, right? Don't go up and breathe on someone. But let me tell you something. If Jesus comes up and breathes on you, you're not going to cover your mouth, are you? You're going to take that in. You're going to take that in. And those disciples, they breathed deep. And don't you know, they held their breath. Mm. I mean, that was the spirit. That was the love. That was the grace of God. And they were soaking up every second that they had with their reason Savior. But Thomas wasn't there. Where was he? What was he doing? Was he running an errand? Did he have an appointment that he thought was more important? Was there an equivalent of a NASCAR race outside of Jerusalem? I mean, was there, you know, chariot races going on? Was there something that he thought was better than being with the rest of the disciples? Was he just going out and getting food? Maybe he needed time alone. Do you wonder, maybe Thomas went back to the empty tomb. Maybe he went back to check it out again because he thought he was dreaming. He wanted to make sure that it was really empty like everybody was saying. And so we don't know where 
Thomas went. We don't really know what he was thinking while he was away. All we know is that he wasn't there the first time that Jesus appeared to the rest of the disciples. He wasn't there, and he wasn't about to believe the news until he could actually confirm. He needed to touch it. He needed to confirm for himself that Jesus was really risen. Honestly, what would you do if you were in Thomas's shoes? What would you do? Would you believe the testimony of your fellow disciples? Would you just believe their word? Or would you want to see? I mean, honestly, how many of you would just believe by, and, and there's no right or wrong, but how many of you would believe what they said? And how many of you needed that touch? I, yeah, I mean, it's it's like, you know, oh, I just, I just got to reach out, reach out and touch someone, you know? I just want to do that. Yeah, and there's no right or wrong in that. But I think Jesus was intentional in the ways that he, he, he showed himself after the resurrection. Um, the scriptures tell us that there were many ways that Jesus showed himself to his followers. Um, in Jerusalem and Galilee, and even had a great barbecue with them on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus cooked, and and uh, they had a great breakfast together. And so, I think Jesus understood that his followers all kind of processed things differently. And I think that's why Jesus had the, his different resurrection appearances. He knew that his disciples needed different examples. They needed different experiences, and that's because. For some, it's real easy to believe on faith alone. Others, like Thomas, they just they just need that they they need that touch. They need something a little bit more solid. And Jesus knew that, and He provided that. So don't be discouraged or or think that you don't have faith if you want that touch. No, 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 no. Jesus knew, and He He gave that grace to everybody because He knew how everybody thinks differently. And so it was a week later that the disciples were locked in the same doors again. And this time, Thomas was present. And Jesus, being faithful to who he is, showed up again and stood among them. And he knew how Thomas was. He knew how Thomas thought. He even knew what Thomas had said. And so Jesus greeted the disciples again and then turns to Thomas and says, Check it out. Put your fingers here. It's okay. It's okay to touch. Put your, put, put your hand on my side. Look at these scars. Aren't they doozies? Look at them, Thomas. Don't doubt, but believe. I want you to hear this. Because this, I think, is important. Thomas didn't need to touch Jesus. Did you catch that in the Scripture? He never touched him. He didn't need to touch him. Remember what happened. Jesus held out his hands and he asked Thomas to touch his side, but Thomas didn't need to. And I'm sure Thomas was moved by the invitation to, to check out Jesus' wounds and his scars and his bodily wounds. I, I'm sure Thomas was, was touched by that, by that offer of grace to confirm what had been said about Jesus. But in the end, Thomas really didn't need to touch Jesus. All he needed to do was see the scars. I, I think there's a way that we can understand maybe what, what Thomas was going through. And I've, I've, I've kind of learned this from the Antiques Roadshow and, and from that Pawn Stars show. You ever watch some of those things? I mean, I tell you what, the junk that I have isn't worth anything. But, uh, I, I, but it's cool to, to see people have different antiques and the history behind it. And so I've learned a little bit about, about antiques. And, and I know that there is something peculiar about really fine silver. I don't know if you've ever looked at old, fine, expensive silver, but high quality silver is always identified by markings, by the jeweler, by the manufacturer. Did you know that? That silver is always marked. 
right? And those markings, do you, do you know what those markings are called? They're called hallmarks, right? Did you know that? I didn't know that. They're called hallmarks. And the history behind that is really quite fascinating because many years ago, you know, you had um, all of these things being made of silver. You know, you had pots and dishes and trays and utensils and jewelry, and they were produced by members of a guild or a union. And early on, all of the members of this guild would live together and work together in the same complex. And at the same time, they would meet up in this huge room, the largest room of their complex, and it was called the hall. And that's where they would work on their silver. But as years passed, the use of those large rooms changed. It was no longer the workspace, it became the dining area. And it also came, became the place where the silver would be inspected by the masters of the guild. And if an item was deemed good enough, it was sealed with the mark of the guild hall. And that's where it comes from, the hall mark. It was always done in the hall, and it was marked to identify which guild made that silver piece. And so hallmarks are etched into, into every fine piece of silver, and, and it's done so for two reasons. The first is to show that it is exactly what it appears to be, that it's pure silver and that it's not made with lesser materials. So the hallmark is a sign of quality. It's a sign of purity. Secondly, the hallmark indicates the source, right? It, it, it shows which guild, which hall made that piece, and it could actually tell you what individual of that union made that piece. And in England, hallmarks can be used, um, or the hallmarks can be letters, the hallmarks can be initials, they can be different signs or symbols. And for example, if it's a leopard's head, if that leopard's head is on that silver, then it means it came from London. If it's a, if it's a castle hallmark, then the, that silver piece came from Edinburgh. And if there's a crown, that piece came from Sheffield. And if it's a, an anchor, then that means it came from Birmingham. And so those different symbols indicate the source. And the use of these hallmarks were first used and first invented back in the early 1300s when King Edward of England declared that every piece of precious metal had to be marked with something guaranteeing its purity. You notice that money or valuables still has those marks used today in various ways. You know, we still practice that today. So why am I telling you this history on hallmarks? Listen to the good news. For Thomas, the crucifixion, the scars of, those crucif of that crucifixion, the scars became God's hallmark of the most precious treasure ever given to the world. You hear that? Thomas saw those scars and he knew that this was the most precious gift the world could ever receive. Jesus even provided a crest so that we could remember all of this. And this crest was made on the crest of Calvary. The crest that Jesus gives to us is right there. The cross of Calvary. And so a hallmark guarantees the genuine nature of the silver. The scars, I think, served the same function for Thomas. And again, he didn't need to touch Jesus. That's what's really cool about the story. He didn't need to touch Jesus. He saw the scars and he knew Jesus is the real deal. He saw those scars and he knew that he never had to doubt again. The sight of those scars took all doubt away. Do you realize that you and I carry our own scars? Some of the scars that we have are on the outside, 
Like, you know, I have these darkness under my eyes. Those are scars. Um, because years ago, I had very uh, um, painful um, sinus problems. And the pressure was so great that they bruised my eyes. And I can't get rid of them. And I have other scars on my body. I broke a glass jar once in my hand trying to remove the lid and the glass shattered and got a nice scar right there. We, we have scars in our bodies that show or, or say something about a trauma or an injury that our bodies once went through. And you know, you can see those scars, right? You see them on the outside. But some scars, they can't be seen. They can only be felt in the heart. They can only be felt in the spirit. And no one can really see them. And these, these, these psychological, emotional, and spiritual scars are essentially invisible. We, we just, we carry them inside. But I want you to hear this. That Jesus can see those scars. He can see those scars inside of you. He knows the pain that those scars have caused to you. He knows that these scars have even caused you to doubt others, or these scars have even caused you to doubt yourself. Because sometimes that's what scars do. They make us doubt. Jesus knows this, and he sees it, and he feels even those scars too. And, and I would say that Jesus knows all about our scars, and with his grace... He carries them all. He carries his scars and our scars. But you need to listen to this because this is really cool, my friends, because the pain, the torment, the hurt, the devastation that originally caused those scars was nailed to the cross with Jesus. It died with him and it was buried with him. It died. And sealed away, it was sealed away in that tomb. And the good news is that because it was sealed away in the tomb with Jesus, it no longer has to plague you because you really need to hear this. What plagues us, what scars us, and what we give to Jesus and that he takes to the cross and to the, to the tomb, what Jesus carries to the empty tomb is not raised on Easter. You were raised to new life, not the things that cause you pain. And you got to know that. You have to believe that. And if you need a little bit of tangible evidence, find a cross to touch. Believe that the scars and the pain do not have to define you. They're buried. They're dead. They're gone. They were not raised to life. You were raised to new life. And so today, I want you to realize that just like Thomas, I mean, he had his doubts. He had his struggles. But he was raised to new life too. And that kind of gives hope for the rest of us who struggle with doubt. Because... Your pain and your scars you can leave behind as you receive Easter life. And so today, I want, you to, I want you to touch those tender places in your heart and in your memories. I know it's uncomfortable, but maybe there are some scars that you haven't let go of yet. So I want you to touch them. And I know it's uncomfortable because they've caused you pain and hurt. So touch those places, touch those scars, and then let Jesus touch them as well. Let Jesus touch those scars with his healing hands. Hands that were marked with the hallmark of heaven. Do you hear me? Those healing hands marked with the hallmark of heaven. Hands whose scars speak of God's amazing grace. Remember that God loves you. God loves you so much that he sin, sent his son to prove to you God's love. There's your proof. And if you need something a little bit more tangible, touch it. 
Grab a hold of that cross and remember that Jesus was sent to show you God's love. So let yourself be touched by the love and the grace of God. If there's anything that you should do today is trust in the healing power of the scarred hands of our Savior. Because what are those scarred hands but the hallmark of God's heavenly grace? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we cannot bless your name enough. We cannot sing enough praises to adequately express the joy that Easter brings to our hearts. But here we are in worship because your grace compels us to give thanks. Your grace gives voice to our praise. Your grace provides that blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. And oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And as we think about Thomas and his struggles, we only ask, God, that you strengthen our faith and trust in you. That you remind us that closed doors can never stop you. Remind us that death never has the final word. Remind us that brokenness and pain is not our future. Instead, remind us that with you, all things are possible. And so pour out your possibilities upon us this morning and renew and revive our lives so that they may reflect the Easter life that you give. Bless the life and the work of your church. We need the life that only your spirit can bring. And so God, breathe upon us as you breathed upon those disciples. Breathe life into your church. Breathe gratitude into our daily living. Every day, God, make us say thank you. Help us to see our blessings. Breathe gratitude into our daily living so that we never forget that you are God. Breathe passion into our ministries, renewing our efforts at discipleship and for our lives to look more and more like Christ our Lord. And Father, we give you those scars. We've been holding on to them far too long. And we need you to have them. And we need to trust today that those scars died with you on Good Friday. And those scars never had a chance of making it out of the tomb. So help us to celebrate the truth that we are resurrected to new life. Not our sin, not our pain, not our scars. And as we pray this morning, we ask that you bless Ruby with your healing mercies. We're glad she's home. Continue to make her well. We also pray, Lord, that and give thanks that uh, Jeanette Feist is home as well after her surgery. Continue to bless her. We pray also, God, that you be with Pat Schmidt. Lord, Father, you know that her cancer has returned. And pray that you give her the healing and the grace she needs. That you be with B.B. Connor, who is recovering from a back injury, and we ask for relief of pain. Let your continued blessings of healing And mercy be upon Nadine Meek and John Ballard, for Betty Calden as well. Father, we trust you with our prayers. We trust you with any, everything. And we offer you that trust as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, just a a few announcements. Um, 
I want you to share some love to Marianne Hatfield. She is awesome. We love you, Marianne. And uh, you are you are a gift. Um, every time I hear you, you 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 just you have a great way of playing that instrument. That is just touches my heart. Um, also, I know Andy Watson wanted to ask. Uh, she's trying to get college care packages together, and she needs names. Uh, so if you have a college student that's uh, off and away and studying, uh, if you could send that to the church office because we want to get those care packages together. Uh, and get them out at the appropriate time. Andy, was that, is there anything else? Thank you. So yes. Okay. So we need all the the full name, full contact, and we'll put out a dot box for donations. But yeah, they're going to be starting finals early, early. My goodness, early May for A and M Aggies. They they they're pretty quick. That's that's a early, uh, but we pray uh, that they uh, that we can get those boxes to them in time. That they can enjoy those gifts and those treats. Also, uh, we had originally signed up and uh, to do a cleaning a church clean day. We're going to change that. Instead of doing one day, we're going to develop projects and share them with the church. And if you want to adopt one. There's just some minor stuff that we need to do. And so we're going to go that route. So we're not going to gather on Saturday. Instead on Saturday, if you haven't heard, uh, Habitat for Humanity is doing a fundraiser. And uh, they're going to be skydiving out at the airport. And uh, I actually wanted to do it. But I weigh too much. (laughs) You got to have one of those military parachutes for the likes of me. And so, no, there's, there's uh, I think, 17, 20 jumps. And, and what we're doing is we're raising money. Uh, we're going to build um, about a dozen um, cottages that are uh, accommodating to our senior citizens. Um, these are going to be kind of ADA-type cottages, so not full houses, but they're very nice. They're going to be very spacious, but it's, it's going to be a place, a safe place, because um, sometimes people... I mean, you, you just can't keep up with house, house maintenance. And so this is our next project in Habitat for Humanity. We're going to get that going. So you can go out. You don't have to jump, but you can go out and, and uh, there's going to be refreshments. You can make a donation. Um, you can just uh, enjoy watching somebody scream for a few thousand feet. So my goal is to lose weight and jump next year. I, I would do it. I would do it. So I'm going to do it. Um, so if you see me like looking like Rocky going down the street, just pick me up when I fall down because it's, it's not going to be pretty. Are there, are there other announcements? Anything else we need to share? Yes. Not this coming week, but next week is our work week at Second Chance. I know Maxine does a wonderful job of calling you. Um, If you're not on the call list, but would love, we would love to have you volunteer um, just any time from Tuesday to Saturday, three hours or whatever you can do. Um, We really need the workers. we have some spots that we still need to fill. So if you could talk to Maxine or Judy or Sandy or me, that would yeah. be great. Thank you. Raise your hand so people can put a faith. Yeah, that's Maxine. She's a great worker. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, sorry. My eyes don't work. Uh, VBS. And children. 
Yeah. Yeah, we do. For VBS. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have any other volunteers that want to go skydiving with me next year? Frank, you want to go with me? I figured you might go out first. All right. Well, my friends, we're going to sing our closing song. You know, if you need that crest to remember, to believe who Christ is, just lift high the cross. Let's stand and sing. Friends, I pray that you leave something behind after this service, that some scar, that there's some regret, that there's something that you can let go and not doubt, but believe that it's gone, that it has not been resurrected because you have been resurrected into new life, everlasting life, abundant life, whole life, renewed life. Go forth and live that beautiful life that God provides. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen.